Uh, the idea that the brain is plastic in the sense of changeable, adaptable, malleable is, I have uh, come to believe, the single most important change in our understanding of the human brain in 400 years. It's revolutionary, and since all human activities emerge from the brain, any change in our understanding of the brain ultimately has a major impact on anything that we do. I define neuroplasticity as that property of the brain that allows it to change its structure and its function. And that's in response to the actions that we commit ourselves to. It's in response to sensing and perceiving the world, and even quite fantastically, to thinking and imagining. Some very, very brilliant experiments conducted by Dr. Eric Kandel at the end of the uh, last century ultimately led up to the demonstration that human thoughts and learning actually turn on certain genes in our nerve cells which allow those cells to make new connections between them. Eric Kandel was a psychiatrist who actually wanted to be a psychoanalyst. Uh, he came from Vienna and when you think of that you think of Freud. And interestingly enough it was Sigmund Freud who in the 1880s and 90s first speculated that thought actually leads to changes um, between uh, the connections in the brain cells. And in fact, he called it the law of association by simultaneity. Now, neuroscientists say neurons that fire together, wire together. Uh, Freud called it the law of association by simultaneity because he thought when you experience two things simultaneously, the brain wires them together. So that's in part why you have a psychoanalyst here talking about brain plasticity. Another reason is that when I would be working as a psychiatrist and analyst with patients and they didn't get better, my colleagues were increasingly saying, well, these problems have been hardwired into their brains. Uh, because I was a poet, I could tell a metaphor when I heard one. And I knew it was a metaphor because, yes, when pa the same patients did get better, nobody mentioned anything about hardwiring. Hardwiring was a kind of shorthand for the notion that these circuits had been genetically predetermined. This whole area has the sense of the fantastic about it. The idea of thought changing the structure of matter. The Western tradition begins with the notion uh, of, that thought changes matter in the sense of the, that the Old Testament begins and God said, let there be light, and there was light, and words led to the change in the structure or the development of the universe in that story. And, of course, the New Testament says in the beginning was the word. And Plato spoke about this, the superordinate power of ideas and forms um, in somehow or other governing our lives. But that was, these were, in some respects, supernatural ideas, the idea of thought changing structure. Um, the Bible doesn't have the word nature in it, actually. Um, these, were about, these were extraordinary events. And yet, I can just will to raise my right hand, and my right hand goes up. And in some ways, it's a very ordinary event. So we're, in some ways, very much of two minds about this whole notion of thought-changing structure. Now that we're beginning to understand how these structures change, Brain plasticity has implications for medicine, psychiatry, psychology, human nature, love, sexual attraction, acculturation, acquired tastes, our understanding of why addictions happen, pornography addictions. They have implications for politics, for business. Anything having to do with human training or education has to be re-examined in light of neuroplasticity. In fact, anything having to do with culture has to be re-examined in light of neuroplasticity because it's no longer sufficient to say that the relationship w between the brain and culture is a simple one where the brain produces culture. We now know, in fact, that culture also rewires our brains. Neuroplasticity gives incredible hope, and I'll give you just one story. Um, but it also tells us that this resilient brain that's emerging is also a more vulnerable brain. It's very sensitive to what other people, other, other brains do to it. Um, and we're very influenced by our technologies.
So when I first got the sense that the human brain might be plastic, it seemed that there were these people working, scientists and all, all, of, of all kinds and clinicians who were working in very different intellectual silos and they weren't always talking to one another. And I set out to find people, clinicians, at the cutting edge of this astonishing science who had already used it to transform people's brains and so that I could actually see with my own eyes what was happening. And if I heard that someone allowed someone with a stroke to get better, I wanted to be able to push against that person's hand and feel how it had changed. And in the course of my travels, I met a woman with half a brain that wired itself. Um, I, I found um, many instances of learning disorders that were completely cured. Blind people who had people who had been congenitally blind since birth, learning to see with, in new methods, strokes and brain traumas um, changed, chronic pain erased. I saw children with cerebral palsy, a severe condition, learning to move their little hands more gracefully, and in my own practice, increasingly saw examples of how these principles could be used to alleviate entrenched anxieties and depressions. Now, the reason that this is a revolution is because for 400 years our best and brightest scientists actually thought of the human brain as a complex machine, like a computer. A machine with parts, with each part performing just one function. And that is very much alive and with us today in the notion of the brain as a computer. Every time you open your newspaper and you see a picture of a brain scan and they say, this is where your brain processes music, in this part here. Well, it's all much more complicated than that. But this notion of the brain as a computer gave rise to what I've called a neurological nihilism because it meant that those who were born with brain deficits or brain limitations had necessarily to live with them in all cases. It meant those who had sustained brain trauma in all cases could do nothing about it because machines do many glorious things but they don't grow new parts, they don't rewire themselves. In medical school, I was taught all of these things and that there were no new cells in the brain. Um, and anyone who had a normal brain, who hoped to improve it or maintain it as they aged, was probably wasting their time. And above all, human nature, which was seen to emerge from the brain, was also seen as necessarily fixed insofar as we saw the brain to be fixed. Now, all this turns out to be spectacularly wrong. I'm not saying that the brain is infinitely malleable. I'm not greeting a bad metaphor with another extreme um, statement. I'm saying that we've underestimated the, what our brains can do and that we have to move more to the sensible middle in understanding and appreciating what change is possible. And the following question, of course, must occur to each of us, which is, okay, so if the brain is plastic, if it's been plastic uh, since the beginning of our species, how is it possible we missed it? 